Good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to this crowdcast hosted by the Southampton Data Science Academy. Thanks for joining us. We're going to wait one minute to precisely 2.15 GMT, uh, and we'll kick off and uh, walk through some content. Please do engage with us on the right. There's a whole bunch of questions and chat conversations ongoing. Right, I think we'll kick off. So welcome to the Southampton Data Science Academy's primer. Um, this is a 45 minute session hosted by myself, Stuart Coleman and Rob Blair, senior academic and lead tutor for the Southampton Data Science Academy. Uh, I'm gonna do a quick five, six minutes intro, and then hand over to Rob to talk and walk through some of the course material. Um, just a few starting pieces of housekeeping with Crowdcast. Uh, you can ask questions by putting your chat in the side thread here, where I'm showing. Um, we welcome questions at any time. Uh, Annie is, is on tap and responding to many of those questions. Um, if we can't answer them, we'll come to them at the end. This will be recorded. So if you wanna share this with people after today, you're welcome to. Um, and anyone who completes attending today is eligible for a 10% discount on our next intake, which starts on May the 8th. So a week today, uh, we are taking in a new cohort of students. We'd love to have you with us. What are we going to cover? Um, quick five slides on what we're doing with the Southampton Data Science Academy, why we hope, believe, and hope you will endorse us taking a different approach. Uh, quick look at our course offering. Um, and then we're going to talk about our tutored delivery model. Um, and then Rob is going to actually take us into the learning environment and give us some examples and show us around. So. Just a quick intro to the Southampton Data Science Academy. Um, we are almost two years old. Um, by the end of this year, we'll have been operating for two years. And we're delighted to have come from a collaboration between the University of Southampton's Web Science Institute and global leader in online and offline education, Cambridge Education Group. Um, our focus really is on tackling what is a recognized data skills gap in industry, leveraging the research of the university, but making industry-focused data science education accessible to everyone, not just technical people. Uh, here's some of the people behind the academy. Uh, Professor Dame Wendy Hall is well recognized for her work in uh, web science, data science, and recently led the UK government review on AI. Uh, Rob Blair is a well-experienced teaching fellow um, and resident academic at the university. And Professor Elena Simpel has various accolades working across Europe uh, in all manners of data science exploration and research. So what we're primarily offering from our existing platform is access to six weeks intensive data science short courses. These courses can be completed online alongside your work. We typically estimate between 10 to 15 hours of uh, study time per week, depending on the level students are at and how much support they might need. Uh, and at the end of the course, subject to passing the assignments, you get a certificate recognizing your studies from the University of Southampton, as well as continual professional development points if you're working in industry. Um, this is our portfolio of current courses. Um, 
you can see that we have both technical and non-technical courses. So there was a question earlier in the chat thread asking what the difference was. It's very simple. Technical courses are for people who can code and ideally can code in Python, which is, we believe, generally accepted as the future standard for working in data science. Um, but we offer an equal complement of technical to non-technical courses. Um, some of our research, most recently, we, we surveyed 40 leaders in data science from FTSE 250 companies. That's the largest 250 businesses in the UK. We identified that there's a real thirst and need for non-technical leaders in business to understand data science and AI in more detail. Uh, and we're excited to be launching an AI and machine learning specific course for non-technical people um, starting in September this year. So if anyone has any questions about any of these courses, Rob is going to show a little bit of some of them, but please do ask questions about the specific courses. That's what this is for. Um, so just to, to emphasize this, this point, um, over the last year, we've had over 100 people through our courses, and many are not technical practitioners, but are people in leading management roles, are policymakers, managers, um, all looking to understand how data can have more of an impact in their business. Um, and I think we've developed and iterated on our approach. So we know there's a lot of courses on data science out there. And what we're striving to do is offer something different um, with a couple of differentiators, specifically the ability to work with the university, um, bringing the tutors from the university to support students online, either in peer group discussions, which allow students to participate as much or as little as they may want, or in one-to-one -one tutorials, perhaps where a student is struggling, really wants that intimate help and assistance, um, but also leverage the self-paced approach that online learning offers above and beyond face-to-face -face education. Uh, and of course, making sure that, that our courses are accredited and recognized both academically, but also by industry. So um, that's all from me. I'm gonna hand over to Rob and help assist uh, with questions now. Rob, I think um, you're probably gonna want to share a screen now. Okay, folks, uh, I'm going to share my screen with you now. And I'm hoping everybody should be able to see my screen. Stuart, there we go. And I'm hoping everybody can see my screen. Stuart, uh, there we go. Oh, almost there. God bless technology. So anyway, what I'm going to do is, um, uh, Stuart, can we sh uh, uh, change the image on the screen so that the main picture is my screen? Yeah. That's it. That's excellent. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start off with uh, what might you see um, here? I've created uh, an account, a student account, and I've created a student account because what the students will see and what the administrators see is going to be slightly different. So, for instance, here is a student who is enrolled upon two courses, data science for digital marketing and our fundamental data science technical course. So, for instance, if I were to select the digital marketing course to give you an idea as to how this would, this process would work, I'm just going to go through what will the student see, how will you interact with the course. So, digital marketing, if I click on this, you should see that what will come up is you have, first of all, on the left-hand side, you have your platform menu, but then within the, the browser window, you've got your course menu, and you can see you've got your home page, announcements, modules, assignments, etc. So here's a, a typical home page for a course, digital marketing. And this particular instance, time is of the essence for people who are, you know, you're working a nine to five. So we're not going to load you up with lots of text unless, of course, you want to read that. So we have a brief introduction. And then in this particular instance, we have uh, Associate Professor Dave Millard. And he's talk, He's introducing the course, and he will go through this presentation. It's a video presentation, and it's less than five minutes long. So the point is that it's accessible. So the next thing I would suggest is um, if I wanted to see 
what is part of this course, I have modules. And the modules are basically showing me what I've got on each particular week. So my first week, so the, your introduction week, or introduction course information will be released two or three days before the course starts so that you can do things such as uh, test your uh, equipment, your software and hardware so that you can run a, um, a, a, a conference, which and a conference will take place when you have your uh, tutorial with your tutor. So you can interact with the platform and here you have your lists of uh, what's occurring on each particular week and at the start of each week the module will be released so you can't see the entire course because otherwise people do have a tendency to think i know this part i'm just going to skip to the next part and next thing you've missed something so that's an inter uh, that's where you can access materials well, as stuart alluded to uh, one of the uh, one of the major uh, parts which we uh, promote as part of our learning process, uh, we're very much focused on the idea of a connectivist learning process. And the theory is that the best way to learn is to learn with others who are going through the same learning process. So to that end, we have such things as, we have, uh, sorry, I clicked on the wrong button there. So let's go for, well, you can see you've got a series of assignments here, but here we have discussions. So basically we have a series of, of discussions here. So here somebody has said course requirements, uh, collecting data about features. So there's a discussion which has been placed on the board and then uh, participants are actually uh, being asked to input their thoughts. And so there, we, we promote discussions between participants. Um, so not only do we have uh, discussions, we would also have conferences. So what's a conference? So for instance, here is an example conference. And what would happen is you would just join the conference and you would have a, uh, your tutor would set up a conference or a participant can set up a conference if you wish to discuss your work with other participants. But what happens is on each course, each participant is entitled to a 15 minute tutorial and that 15 minute tutorial will be a, uh, I'm just going to, uh, this is what the person would see if they were looking at this tutorial, they would have a tutorial with their tutor. So there is actually a um, uh, you know, a face to face. So let me just close that because I don't want to cause any uh, issues with the uh, screen sharing. Rob, it's uh, Stuart here. This is great. Um, just just a reminder. I think Lily asked a question about what technical courses you might look at to check if you're up to scratch on Python to do this course. Uh, ab absolutely, absolutely. So uh, the, there uh, there are two technical courses which are um, uh, uh, recommended, and they're both free courses, and they are called uh, soft. Uh, let me see, soft. Software Carpentry, and these are free courses which are run by the Software Carpentry Organization, and these are recommended on the website. And the uh, workshops, the lessons I would suggest are that you have introduction to um, uh, introduction to Python, Python, or plotting with uh, programming with Python, and also plotting and programming with Python. So, so those are the two courses which we recommend which are freeware. And also, if you contact your local university, you'll often find that they will run a software carpentry uh, session, which, again, is usually free. There are lots of courses out there. There's nothing to stop you from um, working with, for instance, Coursera or um, uh, Code Academy uh, or Data Camp. I mean, there's, there are many out there which are all very good. Uh, but the, course, the, the software carpentry um, sessions are free and they are uh, we run them here at the university and they are designed for people who may have very little coding experience Lily does that help with your question if you're still there please let us know yeah thank you Annie yeah so it's a software carpentry so um, the, the so the next thing I would suggest is um, so if we look on uh, let me see what else here uh, You've asked about the, the technical course, 
So why does Python programming, why is that a requirement for the fundamentals technical course? Well, we actually have um, assignments which are based in Jupyter Notebooks. So if I were to reload that, you would see that so you click on assignments and you would get load up the Jupyter Notebook. And a Jupyter Notebook is something which would allow you to, um, to access materials. So if you are actually, uh, you're, you're T taking the technical course, you would actually ask, access a coding environment which will allow you to write code and run code in your browser. So you don't have to download Anaconda or any of the Conda uh, Python environments. This is uh, allowing you to actually uh, look at and create code and run code in your browser. So when you start it, if you started on this course, um, you would have a container on a course server, which would hold only your um, course material for your programming. An interesting part here is, here is a typical, or here is the first question of our first assignment. And the first question on this particular course says, okay, we're gonna use a web API and we're gonna use some page scraping. And you're asked to produce code to uh, solve this problem, but all of the code all of the assignment questions on this course or any of the other courses, they're all based upon practice material. So at no point are you being just thrown in the deep end and asked to uh, complete an assignment. They're, it, it, they're all based upon the practice material which you're given to support your learning. Um, so I'm just trying to think uh, what else I would say there. Um, yes, you, as I say, we've got the conferences which you can uh, access at any point in time. Two other things which are uh, used often for support is we will run announcements. So I will be sending announcements and your tutor will be sending announcements. And you can see at the start of the course, midway point of the course, at the end of the course, there are announcements just asking, is everything going okay? Are there any problems? What's coming up in the future? Um, uh, are there any issues to look towards? Basically, uh, it's very much the the case that we work with students and we want to make sure that every student gets the end of the course with a positive experience and with all the support that they could need. Rob, just a, a quick interjection. A couple of yeah. questions that I've noticed uh, have cropped up. Um, question from Stephen Allison. Are your courses useful for someone who is interested in becoming a data engineer? Uh, I'll start by having a go at this and, and Rob, I'm sure you'll, you'll pitch in. Sure. Um, I think... Uh, our view is that data engineers and data scientists are similar, but slightly different. Um, they are overlapping in skills, uh, but to my mind, a data engineer would have a larger bias towards coding and working with tools specific to large data sets, um, tools being potentially open source technology frameworks like, I don't know, Hadoop or Spark. Um, as an example and yes our technical course would be useful for those people however we are trying to cover both their needs fundamental level and data scientists so for example in the technical course um, we also ensure that they are getting core grounding in statistics which a lot of software engineers don't have and it's pretty important if you're going to be working um, in data science to know this stuff because if you just come from a development background, you might be uh, unaware of the challenges around causation versus correlation or um, standard deviation, for those types of things. So uh, yes, in part, these courses will be useful for developing and growing data engineers, but you would probably want to invest dedicated engineering courses in, in those types of students too. Hopefully that helps with your question. Uh, if it does, let us know, Stephen. Um, the other question was was from Alex, saying he's hearing two conversations. Hopefully, that is not still the case. If he can let us know whether we are having problems with our sound or whether he is, that would be great. Um, sorry to interrupt you, Rob. I know you were going to continue, so I just thought I'd pick up that question. Okay, thank you, Stuart. Um, the one thing uh, that's an interesting point about uh, data engineers and data scientists, uh, I would suggest that data scientist is actually uh, not just 
not specifically or only looking at data, but also the context within which the data has been um, collected and the context within which the, the um, findings of your analysis are going to be used. So I've just put up on, on page uh, on the screen here is one of our exercises is talking about using Python, but also introducing Bokeh, which is a visualization library. So a data scientist, to my mind, will not just carry out, um, and I use the word just loosely, but will not uh, only be carrying out analysis of data to come up with a finding, but also what does this finding actually mean? How useful is this finding in our business context? or in our research context. So it's not just, I've analyzed this data and this is what I find, but also I've analyzed this data, this is the story that it is going to tell us when we've completed our work. And then also be able to um, uh, relate this to and make it understandable to those who are not uh, actually um, you know, highly technical. And when I say highly technical, what I mean is they're not using coding on a daily basis. Okay, they're, they're not doing a lot of programming. Uh, people, uh, they're essential to the process. It's just they don't particularly work in this, you know, the data science aspect of it. So the difference being, I believe that a data scientist has to be able to talk and to uh, uh, converse with those who are not technically um, grounded, as it were, as opposed to a, a data engineer who will be talking and, and working with those, to my mind, who work in that that's um, that domain, so they're much more technically oriented. So I, I, I sorry, I hope that answers your question. Um, so what else can I tell you? Uh, one of the things I was going to mention was that on uh, this particular course, or on all our courses, you can see on the platform here that we have a calendar. So what will happen is your tutor will turn around and will place on the calendar a series of uh, tutorial slots, which as a participant, you would just book. And we offer the different uh, tutors for the different tutor groups, offer a range of hours. So if you cannot make it between two and six on one day, you may make it between 10 and 12 on the next day or nine and three the day after. And you would just select one of the available tutorial slots. And then your tutor will set up the conference which I talked about earlier, will set up a video conference and they will be uh, you know, having this one-to-one -one discussion with you, uh, giving you the support, hopefully, which will uh, meet any issues which are arising. I mean, uh, with the technical uh, course, um, what will happen is if I have a tutorial with a student on the technical course, which involves programming, I can actually look at if a student uh, has been working on an assignment, I can look at their work. I cannot edit their work, I cannot change it, but I can look at their work so that when I have a tutorial with the students, the time isn't wasted. Our first thing is, okay, I see that you are so far down the assignment, but you seem to be stuck on this problem. Let's have a look at that. And also it allows me to, to give much more focused advice. The, the, does, does that make sense? Rob, we've, it, that was helpful. We've got a question from Nathan Williams um, asking what type of technical background is necessary for the data security course, and that's the technical data security course. Do you want, do you want to have a look at oh, that and maybe perhaps yeah, the, the, show the some of the content and course, talk through it? Absolutely. Um, the, the difference, so we have two courses and uh, which are starting next week. The first course is um, uh, so Lily is asking, does the technical course cover both the analysis and advice on bus and trans? Okay, Lily, uh, I, I have a feeling you're talking about the, uh, the fundamentals of data science course there. I'll just um, uh, stick with Nathan's question for the moment, and then we'll move on to the, the technical course. Please tell me if I'm wrong. Uh, Nathan, the, the, um, the, the difference between the two courses is that the uh, non-technical course is aimed at those who are going to be working with um, the, the technical operators or those who have all the technical skills who might be building websites, who might be looking at um, infra, uh, data infrastructures or uh, uh, system infrastructures um, within an organization. So very much for the, the, uh, the non-technical or we often call it the manager's course is um, the idea that uh, at the end of it, a, a manager will be able to conduct a risk assessment 
which which sounds like uh, something very tr uh, straightforward and trivial to do, but it's actually very complex. Uh, and also, of course, with the introduction in the UK, certainly, of new legislation with regards uh, data protection, uh, it is something which is very important if you are going to hopefully meet all of the requirements. So what I will do now is I will show, uh, hopefully, I will show the, um, let me see now, there's, uh, so bear with me for a second, please. So, so if you can see this screen, if I do this, hopefully you can see this. Now on the technical course, sorry, I've managed to go up. So on the non-technical course, you'll see that we are looking at, for instance, common technical vulnerabilities, humans in the loop, uh, loop uh, risk assessments, and risk practice, then also looking at, okay, how do we mitigate for these problems? And this is aimed at, at, a, uh, at somebody at, who is probably at the, at the manager level. Um, but if we look at the technical course, we have this thing uh, where we introduce, it, we, we uh, compress the um, non-technical content to three weeks instead of six. Then in week three and week four, we will also include um, scenarios where we have set up a website which has specific vulnerabilities and then we would we give you access to the website we would also ask you to uh, probably uh, utilize a um, if you're working on the data security technical course you will be using a virtual machine so you will either and we recommend something like XAMP, which is freeware or zamp as it's known um, with regards to uh, this, this virtual machine, you would install it, then you'd be given the, the, uh, the codes, the, the, the HTML files, and then you'd be asked to try and investigate where are the issues with this website. And there are several issues. Uh, and, then, so, and then through the week, we would introduce how to identify different issues. And at the end of the week, we say, okay, what are the issues? And at the start of the next week, we give you the issues, but then we ask you in a multiple choice uh, quiz, which one of these solutions would you use to meet this particular issue? So therefore, with regards to the, 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 uh, the technical knowledge required for the security course, uh, it's, it's about um, understanding how websites work and how uh, data information occurs, uh, data exchange occurs. Once you've done that, then you would also be given, for instance, a, um, uh, a scenario. Uh, and in that scenario, you would be, you're, you're, you have a, a university fees office and you have a template and you'll be asked to identify where are the possible vulnerabilities in this scenario. And then you'd be asked to, to discuss how you would mitigate and why. So we, we try to keep the, the coding to a minimum, but for the security course, you really should understand uh, HTML. Um, uh, SQL would be a very good thing to understand. Um, so JavaScript, uh, um, because you'll be looking at such things as cross-site scripting. And the idea being that when you have uh, completed this, you will understand how are, when you have a web-facing interface, when you have customers who can access your organization through a web or through a, a website, how do you ensure that that's absolutely secure? Rob, maybe we can just check with Nathan. That's kind of given him the, the responses he wants. If it hasn't, we can invite him on screen. Nathan, welcome to kind of put you up on screen and, and have you ask these questions directly. Uh, oh, great. Perfect. Thanks, Rob. That's you hit the nail on the head. I mean, one of the other things I would suggest uh, or that I'd, I'd like to get across is that through all these courses, if there are any questions, I mean, so for instance, if you enroll upon one course and then you decide that for some reason that course is not for you, then we're very open to have the conversation, actually, should you be moving to a different course? And, and if those conversations are required, those would occur within the first seven days. So it's, we, we do work very closely to, to, with our participants to make sure that you are going to have the, you know, the, the most positive experience. Uh, if I can just go back to uh, Lily, you were asking, does the technical course cover both the analysis and vice on how best to translate the insight? For That's an interesting question. The technical course on the fundamentals of data science course. So for instance, if we look at our, 
our our uh, our assignment here. We have a question, and the idea is that it's not only writing the code, but it's actually reading and understanding the question. Because as I'm sure many or people are aware, it, it, the question which two people can read the same bit of information and they can take different questions away from it. So to make this um, uh, usable so that you can um, produce a result which is has meaning to others, um, you know, we, we go through the question and say, well, what is it we're actually trying to find here? The one thing I will do is um, I will show you, uh, if I go back to, uh, yeah, I will show you, I will hopefully show you. So if I do this, bear with me for a second. Um, I'm going to show you the, the third assignment. The, 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 uh, the, the question was, will this... Um, uh, visualization. So here we have a, a student, they have access to this material, so you fetch your directory from the uh, the, the uh, container, uh, from, from the master server, and then you can actually access this on your own server or your own container. So what I do here is I say data visualization, and we have an assignment, well, we won't look at the assignment, but let's look at the guided exercise. Now, with this guided exercise, the question was, how do we, uh, you know, can we translate, can we visualize? So what you're being asked to do here is you're using Bokeh, but you're actually going to produce a, an interface for a user to access. Okay, so ultimately what happens here is, if I'm going to see if this will work, I do, uh, and all I'm doing here is I'm just actually loading each of these. So here we have created a slider. So therefore I have a set of data. I apply it to a map. I can alter those uh, values that are being used for the coordinates on my map. So, and here, so here you've got a set of results which have been uh, placed upon a, a, a chart. But what, what I can actually do is hopefully, if I do this, no, it's not that one that's changed. Sorry, it's the one below it. So by changing the code or using a slider, I can actually change what's happening on this, this graph. And, and if, when you develop those skills, then you develop the ability to, do, to produce a result for somebody that when they change the data, they can see the relationship between several pieces of data and they get a visual output. So, uh, and I also notice here, with, I don't know how many people have used Jupyter before, but you'll notice here that there's this number, and that's telling me this is the fourth cell that I have run, which is handy if, you, if you're running a lot of cells um, and you, you don't want to get lost. So uh, here, yeah, so I've got another one, and hopefully, so if I do this, yes. So I have a, a chart here which shows the relationship between two sets of values. By using, you know, one of the skills you'll learn is you can create a widget which will just change the values and change what happens on the graph. Now that may seem simple, but it allows you to create a very powerful tool for telling your story. And so I hope that's, that, that helps you with regards, uh, you know, th this idea of translating data and, and telling a story to those who need to, you know, that you're trying to convince or you're trying to get a point across. Um, so I've got something here. This thing I wanted to show you was, right, excuse me. So here we have, we're using coding to create a map. We're using coding to uh, look at um, latitude and longitude of different states. And then we're gonna say, okay, who won in which states? Again, we're just using our code. We got our longitude and latitude. And then once we've run this, so here you can see that you have a state which is colored blue, so you've got your uh, Democrats in here. Have I got that right? Anyway, you know, what, which, whichever one of these one, you've got your uh, blue or you've got your red, depending upon if I change my, um, my code. Rob, it's... And the point of this being that in your assignment, you'll be asked to do the same thing except looking at a different set of data. 
Is Stuart here, Rob? I just want to step in for a second. We've got a, a ten minute window left. Absolutely. Um, I think there's some there's some good questions coming in down the side. And what I suggest we do now is, I think there was we specifically wanted to talk about how how the tutoring works. I think mm -hmm. there's a question from someone on that too. Um, and I think well, I before we do that, why don't we just go through these questions? Alex, I'm just going to try and get Alex to and see if I can invite him on screen. Let me just see if this works. Okay, that's, that's a very good question uh, from Alex talking about um, uh, a list of the Python skills knowledge which should be, would uh, be required. Um, there are, uh, there is information on the website about this, but uh, if you are comfortable using Python, so you understand the indentation process, you understand uh, uh, iterations, you understand logic, uh, so for loops, if loops, um, you may wish to use uh, iLock or, or dot iLock or dot lock. Um, you will be using the MongoDB, so uh, PyMongo, um, uh, Pandas, uh, Bokeh, Scikit-Learn. Um, there are a number of different libraries, which if you have experience of using those libraries, you'll find the course no problems whatsoever, okay? Alex, you don't have a camera. I'm sorry to hear that. I just tried to invite him on screen. It's fine. Um, okay. Hopefully that answered his question. We've got another question coming from um, Stephen Allison, who I'm just going to see if he can he can join us too. We're very open to trying to get interaction here, but we yeah. understand that people don't want themselves on the screen. Um, okay. so I, that's I fine. We won't take question it. From, from Stephen. So, Stephen, um, you're asking if MATLAB is used and is useful in data science. Yes, yes, MATLAB is used and is dateful. Um, so you've got things like MATLAB, you've got uh, R, the programming language R. These are all useful tools, but the reason why we use and we, we promote the idea of Python is that, I mean, you can conduct data science with Excel or with, you know, not just proprietary Excel, but with uh, any of the the um, uh, open source spreadsheets that are available. You can conduct data science with this. But unfortunately, uh, what happens is, or, or fortunately, uh, today, the amount of data that, avail that is available has changed dramatically. It has increased dramatically. So we're talking about the four Vs of big data. So volume, veracity, uh, validity, and uh, I think it's verification, but basically, You've got huge amounts of data. Excel would fall over if you tried to use these large amounts of data. R and MATLAB, though they're very good, they would still get to a point where they would just fall over because there's just so much data. So therefore, I, this is why we strongly suggest that Python is pretty much the, 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 the future language for uh, data science. And that's, that's a question that's very often asked. Thanks, Alex. So I think we, we've got just a little over five minutes left. Um, we were going to talk a bit more about tutoring and how that works. Rob, did you want to? Absolutely. So uh, what can I tell you about tutoring? As I say, so if, if you look, I'm sharing my screen with you. Here you can see there, we've got a tutoring um, scenario where you can just select a tutor slot. Now there are two tutorials which are available to every uh, person on, on every course. On a weekly basis, you have access, direct access to a 15 minute tutorial. Now we say 15 minutes, if you need longer than 15 minutes, you know, your tutors, unless they've got another tutorial booked directly afterwards, your tutor will normally work with you to ensure that you've, un you, you've managed to overcome any issues. So you have this face to face. Um, and uh, what was I going to show you? You've got your face-to-face, -face and you've got, uh, it's arranged through the calendar. We also have the, our conferences. Sorry, I jumped ahead there. You have individual tutorials. That's yourself and the tutor, face-to-face -face if you wish, but certainly the tutor will have their video camera turned on. Uh, if you have a very bad connection, you can use text. 
So there's a, a text opportunity, but the, you know, you can certainly, you've got um, audio. So that's face to face. So that is not recorded. Whereas when we run a group tutorial, so your group tu tutor will offer, will run once a week, a group tutorial. And that's where your tutor is opening as running an open session for about 40, 45 minutes. And they're, they're going to answer any questions which participants have sent to them or that, you know, ideally a participant will send a question half an hour, an hour, hour beforehand. But if you don't have time and you've got a question and you haven't managed, managed to make the individual tutorial, you can come along to a group tutorial. And often tutors are fairly good. They, they, if, you, if you're in a different tutor group, the tutor will say, yeah, it's okay, join my tutor group or join my tutorial, that's fine. You know, it's not, it's not that big a deal. The one thing I would suggest is that the group tutorials are recorded. So the group tutorials are recorded and they will actually, um, uh, you, you can see here that I've only got one uh, conference here. Uh, each conference, uh, when, it's, uh, when we complete the conference, uh, that if, it is, if it's a group tutorial, it will have been recorded. So therefore, you will see a list of group tutorials which are recorded. All tutorials will be here concluded, but the group tutorials will have a, a link saying, here's a link to the recording of this tutorial, which is a, that's a good thing. On the downside, it's only available for two weeks. So we're, we don't, uh, you, you can't continually miss a uh, group tutorial and expect to catch up on it because the recording is only available for two weeks. Alex, um, just seeing your message, uh, we will send round a recording of this webinar, so you will be able to just go through the first 15 minutes and, and catch up. Um, thanks for, for asking that, and great that you're looking to, to go on the September course. Uh, I'm just going to do a time check. We have precisely three minutes of this window left. Um, I think what we should do is, is use that to figure out if anyone's got any more questions. Uh, as mentioned at the beginning, we've got our next cohort starting next Monday, May the 8th. Uh, we're delighted to be welcoming people from all over the world on that. We've got people from the UK, people from Korea, uh, uh, people in Germany. I think we've got people um, even in the US looking to attend that. So anyone else who's on this webinar, any other questions about any of those courses, please do shout now. Um, if there's not, I might, uh, might look to close this or, or ask Rob if he's got anything he quickly wants to show. Uh, and thanks to everyone for joining. We've had... Um, 26 people, I think, on this, uh, which is, is not a bad turnout. We had uh, 84 register and appreciate the time people have given. If, if I can say something, Stuart, uh, one thing I, I would um, uh, sort of highlight is that uh, as much as Stuart was saying about our students coming from around the world, uh, we have run as tutors, we have run tutorials for students in Korea, in Australia, in the US, in Germany, in Turkey, all over the, 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 the globe. And the, the point is that we will always try and work with participants to uh, have a tutorial at a time that's convenient for, for both groups, of, for both the tutor and the student. So if, this, if that means that we run a tutorial at uh, five o'clock in the morning, that's what's required. So as I say, we're here to support. Yeah, all hours with you and team, right, Rob? Yeah. yeah. Okay. I think, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, we've got one minute left if anyone's got any more questions. Um, Hugo, thanks for the, uh, for the feedback. Uh, everyone else, thanks for all your questions. As mentioned, this will be going out on a recording. Uh, we also have uh, a survey that we can uh, send people a link to access. Uh, we surveyed 40 data science leaders in large businesses across Europe to try and find out their perspective on, on the skills challenge in this area. And we can share that with people if they um, submit a request on the follow-up to to us. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. And uh, wish you. Uh... You see, we've got a last question there from Alex. Oh, another question. What would be the next data science course? I can't do a further degree on MSc. I'll let you answer that, Rob. Okay. I mean, it. it I, I would suggest again. It all depends upon what your background is. You know where you're coming from, what skill sets you've got, what experience you've got. I mean, very often people will come on to one of these courses and they've already got a, a highly developed set of skills, but they may wish to transfer to a, a different arena. Um, 
it is a question of saying, where can I get experience? When you when you've got the the uh, the theoretical experience and and the practical or the practice experience of the course, then it's it's uh, kind of down to you to look and say, right, who is out there that may be able to offer me this this uh, chance to practice my skills? Oh, I'm sorry, we missed a question from from Abu Ghazi. I, I'm, I do apologise, Abu. Um, uh, well, the course is predominantly based on Python. There is a, a section in the fundamentals technical course which talks about Hadoop frameworks. Obviously, Hadoop is not a coding language. It's a framework of tools for managing large data. So we do talk about and reference Hadoop as an innovation in data science, um, but it is not the language used for technical um, aspects of the course. Correct, Rob? Yeah. we uh, When we're using... Um, uh, when we're interrogating or when we're collecting data, we actually use uh, Mongo. Uh, so we're using PyMongo or, or MongoDB, so a uh, theoretically non-relational database. Um, so in, in fact, you're dealing with large documents or what are, what are known as large documents of data. They are related, but it's not quite the same. Uh, there is a difference between this and the use of uh, your typical database, which would utilize SQL. And the reason we use uh, Mongo is that it allows you to do a lot more on the fly. So you can actually create new files, new fields. Um, you can you can do a lot more with it. It's a lot more flexible uh, and for stuff that you want to change immediately as you're developing your code. There are pros and cons to it. There, there are, if you look online, there are some really interesting articles about why Mongo, uh, MongoDB is such a fantastic tool. There are you know just as many that would say, actually, no, this is not what you want to use. For our instance, it's exactly what we needed. And it very much uh, gets the point across. Thanks, Rob. I think I think that that just about does it from us. Um, Abby, let us great, good. Sorry, we missed it. Uh, and again, thanks to everyone for attending. We'll send this round and uh, do come back to us with any further questions. Thanks, everyone. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.